Coming up next, Frank and Mary in Framingham with your hosts, Grace O'Donnell and Arthur Bergeron. But Arthur is not with us today. Today, my guest is David Blaze, Executive Director of Daniel's Table, an organization that seeks to create food security for everyone in Framingham. Stay tuned. Welcome to this episode of Frank and Mary in Framingham. I'm Grace O'Donnell, Director of Elder Services at the Callahan Center. This show is all about my co-host, Art Bergeron's friends, Frank and Mary, who want to live the rest of their lives in their house in Framingham and be buried in the backyard. If you're like Frank and Mary, the question is, who are the people that you need to know and what are the programs that you need to know about so you can stay right here in Framingham? With me today is David Blaze. David is the executive director of Daniel's Table, a local organization whose goal is to provide its Framingham neighbors with access to healthy food services. David, what can you tell us about Daniel's Table and your efforts to make sure that Framingham residents have enough food? Well, Daniel's Table has been in the city of Framingham for the past 10 years. You know, we started off as a, as a small organization uh, really focused on um, helping some of the the homeless residents in, in Framingham. We were making sandwiches on Saturday mornings. Um, but as we um, looked around, we could see other challenges. And so my wife and I, um, over Chinese food one night, um, were kind of half kidding around saying, I wonder what it would look like if we could end hunger in Framingham. Mm. Um, and we both started laughing because it's never been done in this country. There's never been a city that's gone from food insecure to food secure, but I couldn't get it out of my head. Mm. And so I just started, it's been a 10 year process of just implementing programs and testing things to mm -hmm. see what's going to work. And we really feel that we're at that point right now where we can pull it all together and, and make it happen. Ah, that's terrific. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a bit more about some of the efforts you've gone to to connect with people in Framingham? I know you've employed people with uh, various language abilities. Yeah, we have um, Renata, um, who uh, speaks English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Um, my wife speaks English and Spanish. Um, we are in need of someone that can speak Russian. We're getting a lot of Russian immigrants coming mm -hmm. to our um, facility now. But it's, um, it's probably one of the most important roles. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it's difficult to connect with people if you can't speak their language. Right. Even if you don't have the same ethnicity, mm -hmm. it's hard to connect. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, um, being a 66 year old white guy um you know i've it's good that we have others in our organization that can really connect with and, with our clients and that's important with framingham being such a diverse community absolutely we want to make sure we're not leaving anybody out that's so right I, I hope more people might uh, consider working with you uh, if they have those other language abilities right you know because you know it all comes down to trust over the past 10 years, we've developed a, a, a certain level of trust with, with the community. Um, and having um, people of color on our staff that speak you know, a native language just makes that connection even stronger. And that's really important mm -hmm. because we're trying constantly trying to understand what their specific, what someone's specific needs are. Mm -hmm. and, and again, with the language barrier, it's really hard to find that out. Right. So we break through it with, you know, having people like Renata on our staff. Right. For people who don't know anything about Daniel's Table, mm -hmm. I know I'm familiar with all the work that you did, especially during 
uh, when the COVID crisis mm -hmm. was new, when people couldn't go to grocery stores and people were losing their jobs. I think there's somewhat less of that, but can you give people a sense of sort of the, the numbers of meals that you were doing at that time compared to maybe before COVID? Well, prior to COVID, we were working with probably 200 families on a weekly basis. So that's 200 families. So there may be four or five, six right, people so about in a family. Right, so about 800. Mm -hmm. In the middle of COVID, we were probably working with 4,000 individuals. Wow. Um, so it, it multiplied by five. So quite, what we a, were doing. quite a huge increase in your capacity level. Yes, and at the, but at the same time, the Greater Boston Food Bank was having troubles accessing food. So the amount of food we could get decreased okay. while the amount of people that needed it increased. Mm -hmm. And so it was really just trying to shuffle all that and trying to create an environment that we could actually feel like we were accomplishing something, making mm -hmm. sure the clients were getting you know, what they needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was a difficult time for us. Yeah, wow. And have you found the numbers dropping off at all? They have dropped off. I, you know, the, the stimulus money that came in was of great help. Mm -hmm. um, on a national level, it cut uh, food insecurity in half. Wow. It was very, very successful. Mm -hmm. But now all of that money is gone. They are looking to try to extend it mm -hmm. um, because of the results that they've seen but um you know we're back to probably dealing with a, uh, individuals probably a thousand or so on a weekly basis right now so it um, is still more than where you were right prior to COVID. Yeah. Wow. um and it's a wider variety of people we're seeing more professionals um you know we had one woman come up and she had a beautiful car she was dressed beautifully um, and so we were helping her bring her food out to her car and she recognized that we recognized all what seemed to be she seemed out of place and she had just explained to us that you know I I lost my job mm -hmm. this is what you're seeing is the last of that life that I have mm -hmm. and you know at some point you probably would have to give up the car right or something like that so we're seeing more of that and we're definitely seeing more uh, seniors coming, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's when the, you know, when COVID created just so many different challenges for, yeah. for everybody. I imagine for seniors, in some cases, they had their sons or daughters maybe helping out and maybe those sons or daughters lost their jobs right. when COVID was at its height. And yeah. maybe now they weren't able to help their parents. Uh, yeah, I mean, for seniors, you know, there's two things that happen there, you know, COVID affected you know um possibly affected their ability to get food but it also created isolation mm -hmm. which is something that we're really focusing on now and how we can kind of uh, fill those the, both of those gaps right. both food and the isolation part of it yeah now do you require that people um identify what their income level is or anything like that before they can receive food from you? We do. The answer is yes and no. Okay. Um, we do ask those questions because what we're trying to do is we're trying to calculate how much food is missing out of a person's month. Mm -hmm. So we do that, but we're not asking for documentation. I'm not looking for a pay stub or any of those. It's really, you know, in order for us to help and, and be the best that we can be at helping, we need as much information as possible. Right, yeah. So once we know some of, um, some of what's happening income-wise and some of the other things that may be happening in the family, then we're able to set up a, a personalized plan for that, per that person or family. I'd like you to expand a bit more on that. I know we've spoken directly about that but i know for some people they think that once somebody um, starts using a food pantry or a food source like this they will always be using it but i understand that your goal is to to reach people who are in need now but get it to the point where they no longer need those additional resources so can you tell us a bit more about your plans to end hunger in framingham well i mean there is always there's always going to be 
hunger but it doesn't mean it, it doesn't it can be managed mm -hmm. and i think that that's really what we're looking to do is to manage it you know um we designed a software and we've talked about this we designed a software package that allows us to truly coordinate efforts mm -hmm. so we can make sure that um everyone is getting what they need so as I was explaining about the income, when we're doing a client intake, the system is calculating and it determines how much food is missing out of someone's month and then breaks it down into the five food categories of proteins, grains, fruits, vegetables, dairy, et cetera, and gives us a number. Um, someone may be in a family, might, they might be missing 100 servings of protein and 200 servings of grain. It gives us a roadmap mm. to be able to give them the nutrition that they need. It is unique. Um, I was just at a conference in Washington, mm -hmm. um, the White House conference on uh, hunger, nutrition, and health. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at hunger as we look at it it's something that is solvable um, but we really have to work everyone has to work together mm -hmm. in order to to provide the solutions that we're looking for and they're going even further um, in almost in alignment with what our plans are for Framingham you know with a big focus on diabetes prevention mm -hmm. and high cholesterol and heart disease um, those types of things and so we're building into our system now um, if someone is diabetic or someone has heart disease or they have high cholesterol the system will flag mm. that person and we'll be able to guide them to the foods that would match whatever their challenge is mm. and yeah. so you know it again it's a it's a one-of-a-kind it's a one-of-a-kind system that we are really excited to bring to Framingham. And is there, do you have a, a certain way that you're going to roll this out in Framingham? Well, we do have a process. Um, you know, we're hoping to be able to reach every single door in Framingham mm -hmm. with some type of information on how to get enrolled, um, talk with someone about a family situation, what, you know, whatever information that we can possibly give out. Um, we were going to start this very shortly, October 24th, but because we have some um, business partners that asked us mm -hmm. to extend it. Um, so we're going to be starting January 16th. Ah, okay. um, and so it'll be 90 days of strategic planning on mm -hmm. how we're going to get this accomplished, make sure that all everything is in place. Mm -hmm. And then starting that would bring us into March um, or April, and then we'll just roll it out from there and just implement all of the different parts of the parts of the program for the f you know the following nine months and if i'm understanding correctly you're hoping to involve not only city departments but also other nonprofits, local businesses perhaps along with the residents in need themselves well one of the biggest you know if you talk to anybody um that's involved with food the the fact is is more than enough food to end hunger yep. Yep. we all know it and so if it isn't food it has to be something else the delivery system delivery system and the coordination of efforts you know un unfortunately nonprofits don't talk to each other i i think often the case is more that they typically are understaffed mm -hmm. and overworked and it may be harder for them to look out beyond their own four walls to connect with another organization that is trying to achieve a similar goal. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we as nonprofits have to take, we have to find a way to make that connection. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been fighting hunger in America for 40 years mm -hmm. and we really haven't moved the needle very much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with a coordinated effort, we have a real chance of getting, of getting this done. You know, our, the old ways of doing things um, are becoming obsolete. Mm. Yeah. And there has to be a, a new way, a new approach. Because again, 40, in 40 years, we haven't really done, accomplished that much. Yeah. I know uh, I have found you to be very adaptable. 
-hmm. when you first started doing the frozen meals available to seniors, yep. you were very accustomed in your organization of having large meals for families. And the feedback that we got from some of our seniors was, wow, this, this um, serving of spaghetti is enough for a family. I, right. I don't want to eat it because then, you know, I don't want to throw it away. Mm -hmm. So as much as they were in need of food, they didn't want to be wasteful. Right. Uh, but then you listened to what we said and you responded by providing more single serving mm -hmm. meals. Uh, so I find that my experience with you is you do listen to what others have to say and you see, tweak the system a bit to see how you can make success out of it. Well, yeah, I mean, the one thing that we're constantly reminding ourselves is as a nonprofit, it's not our money, mm -hmm. it's other people. They've hired us to do a, a very specific job yeah. of um, providing food to the community. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's, if we're not doing our best, then, <laughs> then they should fire us. <laughs> and so- Well, I, I think you'll, you'll be a long way from that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, we're, um, you know, we, we do look at hunger differently in the way that we approach things. You know, we, we try to look at the whole person, the whole, every, you know, the situation that they're in and be able to cater to those types of situations. So yes, we did recognize that um, our family packs were not going to work for seniors. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, started creating, or my wife Alicia started creating those individual meals and they're, very very popular mm -hmm. yeah um, and so we're really looking to expand that program because right now um, I know there there's seniors that are out there that I or at our organization hasn't been able we have not been able to identify yeah. yeah and so you know that search will start to make sure that we're reaching everybody and that's a big reason why we like to have this program on access cable TV because there are people who don't pick up the newspaper who aren't going to the senior center to find out all the programs and resources right. that are right. available to them so I'm hoping that more people may become aware of this of mm -hmm. your organization and what might be out there and even if not for them but maybe for a neighbor of theirs right. if they know you know there's a uh, a widow down the street who they don't see anybody come to visit, might they be able to check on that person and let them know exactly. here are some other right. resources that you can tap right. into. We are building something. Once, once a senior is in our system, um, if they, they'll be set up on regular pickups or regular mm -hmm. deliveries. If we see that a senior has not picked up food, the system flags us mm. so we can make a phone call. Great. You know, um, because you just never know what's, what's going on. So we, you know, we're trying to put as many um, opportunities within our system to connect with people mm -hmm. and stay connected with them to make sure that they're getting the services that they, that they need. So. Right, and you also know the Callahan Senior Center, our social services, staff can also assist people right. if they're struggling to afford food they may also be struggling to afford That's the right. heat for their home That's and right. so our staff then can help them with doing things like applying for fuel assistance right. or applying for snap so that they can purchase more food right. uh, at the grocery store perhaps right. than their limited incomes can allow yep. so yeah the more we we all know about the services that we can each provide the more we can provide mm -hmm. assistance to people that need it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, SNAP is a very, very, um, it's probably one of the government's most successful mm -hmm. programs, except that, you know, they they kept cutting back on it. Mm -hmm. And so now it's at a, you know, um, it's a limit, but it's in a, in a very strange way. SNAP was paid for out of tax dollars, so it was spread out over everybody in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, it's put on the backs of the people that have empathy for people that are hungry. And that's a much right. smaller pool, right. you know, to try to draw money from, yeah. you know, but it's still being paid for. Either way, it's being yeah. paid for. Yeah. And I yeah. know that seniors very much underutilize mm -hmm. the SNAP, the Supplemental Nutritional right. Assistance Program benefits. And they are available, as, as I say to people, you know, you're all on fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. And years ago, fortunately, there were people who were smart enough to realize, you know, when you retire, your money isn't gonna last forever. And 
you retire on X amount of dollars, but the expenses of other costs of other expenses mm -hmm. continue to go That's up. Right. And so fortunately, there were people who put that program in place just for people like this who are struggling or people right. who are disabled and aren't as able to work as many hours perhaps mm -hmm. as they would like to, or people who have other situations with their family where they're not able to work. Right. Uh, so yeah, yeah it's, it's available for people to tap right. into. Yeah. Yeah. And they should take advantage of it. I, you know, it, it, it's a generation that doesn't like to seek help. Right. Um, right. But it's, you know, it, that's why it's there. And, and that's what I encourage people as well is, you know, um, you, your taxes have paid into this over right. all of your life. That's right. And you have helped others mm -hmm. with this. If you need the help now, there's no shame in that. That's in, right. In fact, we would all rather that you eat well mm -hmm. so that you are staying healthy and right. able to deal with some of the other challenges that come along as you get older. That's right. Uh, so if, yep. if food is one of the, the obstacles, there are programs there to help that mm -hmm. and make use of them. Yeah, we would, you know, anyone that would want to reach out to Daniel Stable, we're, we're there to help. Mm -hmm. So Great. Is there anything else uh, that you want to make sure that people know about Daniel's Table or this initiative that you're coming up with to end hunger across Framingham? Well, they'll be seeing a lot of um, marketing, I guess I'll call it, for uh, the Healthy Communities Project. That's what it's called. Okay. Um, we wanted to, in some ways, separate it from Daniel's Table so we could put a lot of focus on it okay. and what we're trying to accomplish in a year's time. Um, you know, and just to, I think, respond if, if um, you know, there'll be, we'll be doing all the social media, there's banners that'll be going up in town, there should be a flyer or something at everyone's door. If you need help, just respond and mm -hmm. we'll be there. Mm -hmm. no, um, you know, we're building a, um, a large group of for-profit companies to help us. Uh, we have a seafood company in Boston that's committed 4,000 pounds of seafood on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. a meat company that's uh, committed 900 pounds of meat on a monthly basis, and we're building and building that with produce and milk and all of those types of things. Because when we, I believe when we have people, everyone enrolled, you know, we're going to need 30,000 pounds of protein on a monthly basis. It's going to be a sizable uh, project for us. And so will you be seeking volunteers to help in these efforts as well yeah. as employees? Yes. Yes. So both. Yeah, because we'll, we'll be probably be, right now I believe we deliver to about 40 families a, a week. Mm -hmm. uh, we're probably going to, that'll probably go up to 300. Mm. I'm probably going to guess. Okay. As we start dealing with more seniors. Um, Fortunately, DoorDash, the company DoorDash, is mm -hmm. now um, doing free deliveries for nonprofits, so ah, we're going to get involved in that. Good. Um, I have good. to go for a training to find out what it's all about, but um, you know that'll that'll certainly help. Yeah, that's great to hear that you're taking on these different approaches to try to solve this problem that has been with us for quite a long time. Well, I look at, you know, I think the answer is in the for-profit world mm -hmm. yeah, I, because they look at things differently than the right. nonprofit world. And so what we're hoping is, is, you know, that we can tap into the best of what a company could have to offer in logistics and mm -hmm. distribution and food management, all of those types of things. Right. You, know, uh, you know, Alicia and I and our crew, we have a very good understanding of food, mm -hmm. but when you're all of a sudden going to take it and multiply the scale by 10 to 15, you need people that are really, this is what they do right. as a specialty. Right, you, you need those additional resources right. at your disposal. Right, right. and so you know, we'll, you know, we'll be talking to the market baskets of the world, the TJXs of the world, mm -hmm. all of the you know, Whole Foods, mm -hmm. and just tap into their experts and say, okay, here's the problem. How do we solve this? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, obviously it, it's going to cost money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so we're, we're working on a, 
a pretty aggressive campaign to raise the type of money that we're going to need to do this. Mm -hmm. It's not a small dollar amount. It's anywhere between three and a half and five million dollars. Mm. Okay. Um, but right now, based on um, the symptoms, you know, the state is spending $2.4 billion, both insurance companies and hospitals, that's their investment on symptoms. That result from people who that's are right. food insecure. That's right. And so, you know, to solve it, in, even in Massachusetts state, is about 700 million. Mm. So that's 1.7 million less. Billion, I'm sorry, 1.7 billion less, and you actually solve the problem. And and you help people live potentially longer, right. better quality lives. That's right. If you are uh, steering someone who is diabetic away from the high caloric, right. high processed foods into yep. foods that would be a healthier choice for them, as you were That's identifying, right. having more protein, more vegetables, more. Um, other sources of nutrition right. for them. Yeah, because we're even looking at, because we do have people that come to us um, that haven't seen doctors in years. Right. They have no idea if they're diabetic, so we're actually looking at funding right now to be able to pay for um, a glucose test and a cholesterol test ah, as part of the whole package. And mm -hmm. then we can track it. We'll do that every three to six months with them and just be able to track um, to see what types of improvements have been made over over time. So, right. We only have about 30 seconds left yep. in the show. I know you could probably talk for another hour, <laughs> but is there any one more little nugget of information that you want to share with people? I think, yeah, I think if I would just be honest about where you are mm -hmm. and if you need help, then call us. Yeah. And Don't we'll, hesitate. And we'll be there. Yeah. Well, great. David, I really appreciate you being here with us and sharing this great new venture. Thanks. And I wish you success with it. And I'm sure you're going to have more people uh, getting on board with you as well. It's a Thank great you. goal. Thank you. Great.